mercy and say, I guess my baby's got another day. Stood up, broken hearted again. I went to a garden party to reminisce with my old friends. A chance to talk all the memories and play off songs again. I come from a caddy background. I, I started caddying when I was 12 years of age at the local golf club for three shillings a round, uh, which was great pocket money in those days. And uh, learnt about the game, then went into the uh, music business, but then uh, started combining the two. Um, went to a golf tournament um, in 1972, and there was a shortage of caddies. And, uh, I started caddying again, it gets back into your bloodstream and the two jobs have been very compatible. One a daytime, fresh air, exercise activity, the other nightclubs, smoke filled bars and uh, the two combined very favourably. But it's all right now, I learned my lesson well. It's, it's really unwinding time for me. I find it uh, a good way of, uh, of winding down after a hard day on the links. The crooner is veteran backman Paul Stevens, who caddied for Peter Oosterhaus in 74 when they finished second in the Open Championship. An amphitheatre of 23, 25,000 people. And as I say, it equates to um, show business at the highest level where your stomach's in knots and you know the golfer's feeling the same way and you've got to put him at ease and convince him that he's the best and um, carry on with your job and no distractions. It was just a, an amazing feeling, and other caddies will tell you the same. Another employer was Peter Butler, who got a late call up for the 73 Ryder Cup. And although gaining no points, he did manage to write himself into the history books. I remember uh, standing on the short hole, the par 3 16th at Muirfield, and gave Peter the yardage. and He said, What do you reckon they're for? And I said, Well, why not hit the three with three down? And he didn't, he hit it straight in the hole. And I think at that time, that was the first hole in one in Ryder Cup. But no one heard my music I didn't look the same You know I said hello to Mary Lou Cause she belongs to me Stevens is the longest serving caddy on the European tour His career including 15 tournament wins But as well as his singing career He's had it after dinner speaking to his CV And this usually involves caddy towels and the odd joke or two I was caddying for Mark McNulty for seven years And we used to have the odd game together when he needed some amusement and uh, I said to Mark, I said, I'm, Mark, I'm off 16, I'm desperate to get down to nine, I really want to get off single figures and he said, well, that's very easy for you, Paul, he said, uh, just miss out one of the par threes. But it's all right now. Last week at the Dunhill Links Championship, Stevens was on newcomer David Dixon's bag. The pair finished in a tie for 24th and Paul feels that he can give the rookie some of his valuable experience. David is a fantastic guy and a prodigious talent with massive potential and uh, if I can if I can help him um, I'm only too happy uh, to help uh, somebody like him that's just making inroads into the professional game you know that he was the leading amateur at Lytham this year and uh, I've just enjoyed uh, this week tremendously and please everyone so you gotta please yourself thank you very much Professional caddy Ian Wright of Parted Company, an eight handicap hotel receptionist from Zurich, is filling in for one week only. Mark McNulty's caddy for the past four years has been Paul Stevens. While Savvy has been making changes, the McNulty Stevens partnership is working well. No one is doing better on the Volvo Tour than McNulty, and he knows that Stevens fills the bill. I think the sign of the best caddies is to be able to say the right thing at the right time. Not too much, obviously, not too little, and nothing at all is to say the right thing at the right time. If you hit a bad shot, if you can come out with something which will kick you out of the, oh, my God, what a bad shot, or, you know, the mumbling of all kinds of swear words, you know, to say the right thing at the right time, very, very difficult, I think. It's difficult. Um, a lot of players, I think most players are very demanding if they want the job doing properly. I think there's, uh, there's three basic rules, I think, uh, show up, keep up, and shut up. I'm from the old school of caddies that believe uh, you should really only speak when you're spoken to, unless there's a, a definite call for okay. a motivation comment, or a geeing up comment, or a calming down comment. Of course, one of the caddies' most important jobs is to accurately know all the yardages. One, six in from the right, and 76. 
What did you taste today? 71? 71. Downwind. Downwind yesterday. Taking everything into consideration, the club has been carefully selected, and it's the right one. But having reached the green, the next problem the player and caddy face is the putt. How often does McNulty consult with Stevens on the line? 25% of the time, I'll call him across for a line of a putt now. Um, confirmation, really? Yeah, just what, a your ba own basic confirmation. And nine times out of time, I say, it's three inches right, isn't it? You know, that sort of thing. He knows to say yes. <laughs> well, that's what I'm looking for. But every now and again, I'll say, well, what do you think? And he'll tell me. Throughout the year, the putts have been dropping relentlessly for McNulty. This one in Dusseldorf won him the Volvo German Open and took him to the top of the Order of Merit with £362,783. And if he does end up the season number one, it'll mean more than money to Caddy Stevens. It would mean an awful lot. I've done it before. I was with Peter Oosterhaus in his record year. But now, with the strength of fields and the money that we're playing for, it would probably be the biggest thing outside winning a major for me because I know it would mean such a lot to my player. At halfway, his player, McNulty, is seven under par, seven shots off the lead. Out in front is Howard Clark. What I'm going to do tonight, fellas, is answer a, a, a lot of the questions that I do get asked being a, a professional golf caddy. And during the course of the evening, if any of you want to ask me any questions, I'll be only too pleased to answer them to the best of uh, my ability. But I started uh, professional, uh, well, not professional, I started caddying at the uh, age of 12 years, 12 years of age uh, in Rochdale, at Rochdale Golf Club. And in those days, uh, caddying was far more to the forefront of uh, local clubs than it is now. We used to all sit around an old tree in the middle of the car park and you get selected to go out and caddy. If any of you think I did this for the glory, like a, a lot of the caddies do these days, you couldn't be more wrong, because four shillings a round was a bloody fortune to me in those days. I came from a poor, uh, working-class uh, family, and that's how I had to make my uh, pocket money. And I used to caddy for a lot of elderly gentlemen in those days, and it taught me a lot about life, uh, being 12 years of age. I learned different words. I learned the meaning of words like incontinence, Rochdale we have nine out and nine back and at the farthest point of the course there's a halfway house and a telephone and a snack bar and the first time it occurred to me was when I thought I was going for an old boy called Jimmy Taylor went into the halfway house and got on the phone to the clubhouse, spoke to the secretary, said uh, I'm sorry Brenda but I've had a bit of an accident. She said where are you ringing from? He said from the waist downwards. <laughs> <laughs> Learn we were in continents in early age. I worked at a cotton mill in Rochdale, at John Rice, going through the mill there, and uh, I hated it. I was singing at that time, and the cotton dust and everything was an absolute pain to me, and uh, I was probably two hours late for work every single day, I think. I hated the place, and all of a sudden I got a letter one day, and it said, uh, be in the office at 7.30 the next morning. So there I was at 7.30 in the office, and the boss said, uh, what's the idea? He said, you must have been Two hours late every single day for three years. I said, what's the idea? I said, it's like this. I said, you don't pay me a lot of money. I said, by the time I've given the wife a few bowl, a packet of fags, a few pints of beer, game of crib, game of dominoes, down at the club, there's nothing left. Besides which, the wife's economizing. He said, how do you mean the wife's economizing? I said, she stopped buying toilet paper. He said, what's that going to do with you being two hours late every single day? I said, a hell of a lot. The sun doesn't come till half past eight. <laughs> he said, you got here at half past seven this morning. I said, I know I did. I got your letter. <laughs> <laughs> so that was me out into the world, Kenny. And then I graduated on the PGA Tour. And a lot of my formative years were spent out in Australia. And I used to play at a, a wonderful links course just outside of Sydney called St. Michael's. And right next to St. Michael's was a, a monastery. And the Irish priest used to have free play of, uh, of the golf course. And that's where I found that I, I started to get a lot of my material because the Irish priest would come into the clubhouse afterwards and they'd tell a few gags and I'd clean them up and tell them to you. But there's an Irish priest behind me one day, the third hole of St. Michael's, the lovely hole, it's a, a blind par three. It's a great hole, it's built on a plateau. If the pin's at the back, you can't see the pin. And I played, I was playing on my own one day, I got up there and all that, and this Irish piece was stumbling along behind me, and he hit his ball onto the green, the ball trickled up onto the green, and feeling mischievous, I went and knocked his ball into the hole, went onto the tee as if nothing had happened. 
so he's puffed and pants his way up the hill, he's looking around for a few minutes, and finally said, would you have seen a golf ball? I said, well, I haven't. I said, but well, have you looked in the hole? So he's walked across and he said, Jesus Christ, I've had a six. <laughs> <laughs> While I was there in Australia, I had the immense pleasure of caring for uh, many famous people. They must sound self-indulgent tonight, believe me, fellas, I'm not. It's just that I'm very pleased and very proud of what uh, the life of caddying has given to me. I've been out with some of the most famous golfers in the world, and I've caddied for a lot of them. When I was in Australia, I caddied for Greg Norman. I also caddied for Ben Crenshaw, Hugo Green, Bill Rogers. I won the Australian Open with Tom Watson, who's one of my favourite uh, people, and one of my favourite golfers. The finest golfer that I caddied for in Australia was a guy called Sam Snead. I caddied for Sam at the age of 65, he was, and he just shot his own age on the PGA Tour in America. He was without doubt the finest player I've ever seen. The reason I say this was because in those days we used to, um, we used to pick up uh, practice balls. They used to hit the balls at us and we picked them up. And when I um, carried for Sam, I never moved more than 12 feet on either side of the bag that we put down to pick up the ball. And that was from the wedges right up to the driver. And the other thing was his swing never changed from the short clubs from the wedges when he hit the driver. The swing was exactly the same. And he was uh, without doubt the, the finest golfer I've ever seen and certainly that I've ever carried for. The reason that I say that, he did a couple of things that I, I couldn't believe was possible. We had a hole uh, across water, he put the ball in the bunker off the tee, and he had 245 yards to the pin. He hit a three wood over water to three feet out of the bunker. I thought that was the, the greatest thing I've ever seen. He did a clinic where he was hitting one irons out over a lake, hooking them back, bringing them down to my feet, and they were landing just like a butterfly, stopping dead. And I was ducking and diving, and he sang to the crowd, don't move, Paul, they won't hurt you, and they should do. Sam's the best golfer, he's not the best scorer that I've ever seen. Jack Nicholas will forever have that, uh, that title of manufacturing a scorer. Uh, I've been out in Jack's company many times, and the most famous time was probably the highlight of my carrying career, my first Ryder Cup. But it was a lot smaller than it is now, mainly because the Americans used to beat us nine times out of ten. I carried in my first Ryder Cup at Muirfield, wonderful golf course in Scotland. and. Uh, my first introduction was against uh, two guys called Jack Nicholas and Tom Weisskopf, who at that time were the two best golfers in the world. And I was carrying for Peter Butler, uh, playing with Brian Barnes. We got to the 16 team with three down. And we had, uh, we were on the tee first, 187 yards and thin. And Butty, Peter Butler said to me, what do you think it is, a four iron? I said, shit, no, I said, with three down, hit the three. So he hit the three, knocked it straight in the hole. And that at that time was the first ever hole in one in Ryder Cup. We then pulled a 55 putter across the green at uh, 17 and took Nicholas and Weisskopf up the last hole, which to me was a, a big thing in those days. Um, Nicholas is a wonderful gentleman, and if you've got any questions about any of these uh, players, I was with Peter Roosterhouse in 1974 in his record season, in his second at Lytham St. Anne's to uh, Gary Player. And uh, then I went back to Australia, as I say, carried for many, many people over there. And before I go any further, there is a stop press announcement that I'm going to tell you about tonight, that uh, Fanny Sunderson, a colleague of mine, who you know, Gary Sunderson, father, got married today. Uh, she's married the Fiji and Vijay Singh, and he's going to make her Fanny Singh. <laughs> <laughs> So hello, Mary Lou, goodbye, heart. So hello, Mary Lou, goodbye, heart. Yes, hello, Mary Lou, goodbye, heart.